Um, I, you know, I want to start this talk first with a bit of a dedication and uh, an acknowledgement. Uh, this is uh, my 32nd year, my 32nd year in teaching. And I, I suspect you could be questioning that maybe that's, that's a long time and maybe I'm a little bit jaded or, or kind of ready for retirement. And probably that's true. Um, but I got to tell you, I, I haven't lost my passion for education since you know, it began in 1987. And I still feel as relevant and purposeful today as it did uh, 30 years ago. I think that we have an opportunity to, to make significant purposeful changes in people's lives. And I think that's what continues to drive me. And, and I think that I'd like to, in terms of the dedication, I'd like to dedicate this talk to my high school teachers because I think they instilled in me a passion for social justice. We were, we were constantly engaged in, in complex issues, global issues and conversations in class. But we were also involved in a lot of service work and we were constantly in political protests. That, that kind of embedded in me this, this need to be an engaged human being um, and to seek justice for all. So this to my high school teachers that I dedicate this talk. Um, I, I also want to share that you know you you you, you put me on a stage with a microphone and I, I, I kind of feel like I'm in rehab. Maybe it's because of nervousness, but I feel I start sharing things that I wouldn't normally share in any other context. <laughs> uh, things like I'm I'm a, I'm a deeply uh, a practiced introvert, and this kind of space is just not my comfort zone at all. And I suspect there's some of you in the audience who could relate to that. But I won't ask you to identify yourself because I'm sure you wouldn't even if I asked. <laughs> I, I want to reveal something else uh, that I, I hold deeply. It's kind of a, a bit of a shame point for me. I, I am, I am uh, a monolingual and, uh, and, and I, I, I carry that heavily because I, I see people who can speak two languages or three languages or polyglots and I, and I see that with awe and I'm inspired by that. Um, but I, then I typically walk away in despair and shame. <laughs> and, and it's because I, I learned in high school that I'm not good at second languages. In, in fact, I learned in high school that there's probably a few things I'm not good at. There were areas of my learning that I won awards in, but there's some areas that I carry deeply in, in who I am that I'm not good at. Um, I, I learned, for example, in, in that room right there, that I wasn't good at French. And uh, I, I think that it's, the, the disconnect I made at that point is that I wasn't good at learning French in that classroom because it was so disconnected from me and my life outside of that classroom that it really didn't work. And uh, to be fair to my teacher, he probably didn't think we were going to learn French either because he had years of evidence that kids weren't learning French in that context. And he didn't have the, the benefit of growth mindset uh, research that was to come decades later, and nor did I as a student believe in, in growth mindsets. Um, so I, I've challenged myself to learn Chinese for a couple of reasons. One, to prove that the growth mindset theory is true, uh, and one, to prove that uh, you can actually learn a second language post-50, because the research would suggest it's much harder, right? And, and you probably want to start learning a language when you're young. But I want to prove that that's wrong, because I, I do believe the research that says it's more about time on task. Um, uh, so, so here goes. Uh, so that's all. I think for me that's sufficient evidence that I can learn Chinese, so I think I'm going to stop. <laughs> I, I know that, I know that uh, the tone thing is an important part of it, and, and I do believe the research that suggests to get those tones and accents, you really want to start from a young age, but it doesn't mean you can't learn a second language. It really is all about time on task. And it's about time on task not just for a second language, but for math and for English and for anything else that you want to learn. And I think that's important. I'm going to do a quick segment. I don't want you to raise your hands, but if you could think for a second about the things you learned in school that maybe you weren't good at. If I, you know, if I asked you if you're good at mathematics, would you put your hand up? If I asked you if you were good at a second language, would you put your hand up? If I asked you if you could draw, would you put a second? Would you put your hand up? And then I asked you when did you when did you begin to think that you couldn't do those things? When was that in your life? And one of the things that that breaks my heart is that so many of our kids in our really great schools, who by eight years old in elementary school are beginning to already identify as kids who can't do mathematics or who can't draw, or can't do a second language. And I think that that's a, a significant problem for our schools. It's something that is, I would say, generational now, and I think it's something that we need to address. Uh, I, I think that we need to be, as Edwin and Winston challenged us with, is that we need to accept that sometimes learning has to be taken outside the classroom. And I need to take my Chinese outside the classroom uh, if I want to be and find it meaningful and, and really kind of embed in my learning, in the mean streets of, of learning. I would say that the meanest street in my learning from my Chinese is, is my family. Edwin and Winston share that too. They tease me all the time about my tones. And so I think because my daughter is probably my, my worst uh, critic about my tones, I think it's fair to say, you know, she's been learning English intensely for seven years, and quite frankly, she's only okay at it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I, I think it's no easier for kids to learn the language than adults. 
Uh, this is her when she was, I don't know, less than two, and she's learning the alphabet, she's learning a few new words, and this is me trying to give her some formative feedback. You know what, Jade is, I, I think she is my personal uh, experiment in human development. And, and I'm quite sure that when she is 30, she's going to write some caustic memoir about her experience with me. <laughs> or she'll become a stand-up comedian. One of those two things I think will work for her. You know, I think it's important to develop tribe, and, and, and Jade is also developing her tribe. And when we were in Canada recently, she was connecting with my teenage niece, and they were connecting over digital media in a space that, you know, as someone who's kind of used technology for my entire career, there's a whole new tribe out there doing things with technology that I don't really get. Um, and so this next piece, they made this loving little uh, communication piece to me to show uh, this tranquility and love that they have using their digital devices. So I want to share that with you too. choose to come to this event because we're bonding over some really important ideas. One of the things that one of the mission pieces for, for L2 is to rethink education, to rethink learning, and I think that's what pulls us together. And we have a particular agenda around that. It's about, you know, making, connecting learners to the learning more purposeful. I think that's, that's our agenda. And I think that, that that's a really important piece, and that's what bonds us together as a, as a community. I think that it's, it's important to recognize that we have access to resources and tools that our teachers didn't have. We have access to knowledge about how people learn that our teachers didn't have. So I, I think it's okay to let them off the hook. I, I really do, I don't hold them accountable. But I'd like to think in the future of education that our kids won't need to let us off the hook. <coughs> that we will change school in such a way that, they won't, that we will make it so that it serves the needs of every single child, that justice is served for every single child, not just some kids at the higher end, not just some kids maybe to learn, but every single one of our kids is served by the institutions of learning that, that we create. And I think that means that we, we begin to pull apart some of those big systems and structures that standardize things and make it all for one. And I think what, you know, when you go back to our school, really when you go back to your school, if you're working in your classroom, when you're working with your, your leadership teams, whatever your role might be, begin to take down some of those barriers that disconnect us. Look at your schedules and, and your timetables and see how they pull us apart and use them instead to bring us together to connect us. Look at the walls and structures within which you work and see how they can be used to connect us, not push us apart. Think about the, hate, the behaviors and practices that you use in your school and how are they connecting us and pulling us, or pulling us apart. So, you know, I, I, for her, uh, for you and for all of us, I think the challenge is to connect. Uh, to connect physically and come together like we have, to connect digitally and stay connected. Um, and to connect as, as engaged, wholesome uh, human beings who are passionate about the things that we do. So, see you soon.